and increasingly it will be and obviously will be driven by the need to get cost out of the system with declining budgets and lots to do. Uh, I don't see that aspect of incentive going away fast. So w while we all need to recognise and keep the pressure up on those operational aspects, what we do, actually I suspect the real prize will come from different ways of doing business, different ways of delivering service, rather than necessarily a better light bulb. And that takes us down a path that is strictly not green in the sense of environment, although that is very important. Um, sustainable development often gets pigeonholed as an environmental issue, and it clearly is in part, but it is absolutely not as a whole. As you know better than most audiences, government policy operates to a set of principles and a definition of sustainability, and the principles put alongside each other the need to live within environmental limits, which is critical, uh, alongside the need for a healthy, fair and just society, which is just as critical. And it's actually not an either-or. We need to achieve both of those things at the same time. We should not be living in a low-carbon world that marginalises the poor. So when this government talks about wanting to be the greenest and is now starting to work out how to put into practice its commitment to localism, community engagement, across a whole wide range of social and economic issues, uh, I can only be uh, uh, encouraged, I think is probably the right word. So where are the future opportunities? Well, again, some of the future opportunities will be technical and technological, uh, and that's good because in some ways we're comfortable with that. We think that's a, an easy thing to do. A, a private sector example I think is really impressive. Um, Whitbread runs uh, Premier Inns and Costa Coffee. They don't brew beer anymore. And their CEO saw this as an issue uh, that he needed and they needed to get uh, their heads around. So they built, they, they built a new hotel, a new Premier Inn in Tamworth. It's a year old now, and during that year, it has saved 81% of the energy of its predecessor. So they've been running on 19% of the energy uh, of the predecessor hotel, which is a pretty extraordinary saving. Um, same thing for water and waste uh, issues built into that, that particular building. Now, new build is an easier thing to do. I was slightly concerned when I heard it that the customers of Premier Inn in Tamworth were groping around in the dark and having lukewarm showers, but I'm assured that they can't tell the difference between the quality of service they're getting in those two things. So new build and technology offers huge opportunities uh, to start to close the gap between where we are and where we need to be. But more importantly, in some ways, it's going to be different ways of doing business, I think. Uh, I, I've got a couple of NHS examples that are my favourites, and I apologise if, if, um, if I bored you with them before. NHS in Tayside in Scotland, working out that the most expensive of their clients, of their patients, were the poorest. And, of course, one option is to say, right, we need more doctors and pills and nurses down at the bottom end of our economy. And actually what they decided to do was to help those people get jobs. And it was a far more effective way of improving the quality of life and health of those people than giving them more pills and employing more doctors. But, of course, to get them more jobs was not necessarily an NHS task, although they did employ some themselves. They needed to work with local city councils and others to achieve that. That's a, that's a really good example of how we can deliver services differently. NHS in Bristol put a public health expert into the transport department in the council, and probably that individual will never see a patient in a traditional sense in an outpatient clinic, but I suspect may well do more to improve the quality of life and the health of the people of Bristol than if they were sitting with a queue of patients waiting outside an office. And some of it's bound to be price-driven. Uh, the fact remains the only way is up for an awful lot of energy. Uh, the only way is up, should be up for water and those things that we've taken for granted and shouldn't. And it is in interesting how, how price tends to drive performance. And what are we going to need to get there? We're going to need a shared vision, I think. We're going to need to understand why this matters. We're going to need well-informed policies that people recognise and value. We're going to need individuals and organisations prepared to make the running on this, to take the lead. It's going to need uh, the lead, and there'll be risk to a degree involved. And as I've said, I think we need new ways of working together, recognising the kind of complementary core competences. So um, the, some clues may be in a, um, a piece of work that the SDC is just uh, about to report on, so I won't give away the punchline, but we were, we were asked by various parts of government to look at the opportunities, obstacles and ways of maximising the value around the retrofitting of the UK's housing stock. We're going to have to do it to get carbon out of housing and buildings in the next 20, 30 years. 
And so we, we are looking at a vast investment, which the Treasury is unlikely to be prepared to make. So how do we do it? How do we pay for it? How do we get it cost effective? And unsurprisingly, the, the big headlines, I suppose, are we do it collaboratively. We do it in ways that bring together local government, national government, uh, individuals, groups and communities, utilities, private sector, finance sector. Uh, because that's, if everybody does what they do best, you get the best outcome. You generate local jobs. You provide significant economies of scale if you can do it at scale. If you don't try to retrofit every one building or every one flat individually, but you do it by street or by neighbourhood, then you really start to get advantages of scale. And the conversation that's going to be needed for that to happen is beyond carbon. It's about what sort of quality of life do we want as a community? How are we going to get there? How are we going to pay for it? I, I think when that does get reported, uh, it will highlight the, the value of working not just across departments, which we're not very good at, but across sectors as well. And I think that part of that is absolutely uh, the, the solution. The Prime Minister and the Chancellor in the last two or three days are making absolutely clear that government will have to work differently. And the pain that they are bracing us for, they suggest, and the, and the change that will need to happen will last, they've said, for decades, potentially. Uh, there was a comment you may have read from, the, I think, the Governor of the Bank of England, who said that whoever gets into power will probably become so unpopular that they won't be back in power for a generation. So I don't think any of us are relaxed about what is about to happen. And I would argue that if we're looking at delivering public, public services thoughtfully and well and respectfully of, our, of the environmental limits we need to live within, then actually the sustainable development lens is not a bad one to use. If we're trying to work out what not to do, what to stop doing, why don't we think thoughtfully about the implications in the longer term for that happening or not happening? What is, what is the real cost over 5, 10, 15 and 20 years' time of stopping doing certain things? It's vital, of course, that we focus on carbon and on energy. I mean, it's really an important subset of that conversation. Uh, but so is consumption more broadly in that sense. It also gives us, I think, the opportunity. I mean, I think we should look upon this as definitely a glass half full. We should look upon this as an opportunity to look at the way the public sector operates in a completely different way. I'm struck by the number of sustainable development people or people who have that in their job title who are based in or lodged in the operations bit of organisations or departments. I think there's still a perception in lots of places that this is just about carbon, this is just about drafts and energy. Of course, it's vital, but it's much broader than that, and we need people to understand that. And I think if we, if we limit ourselves to that, then we risk missing the big prize. I think part of it is about helping people and encouraging and rewarding people to think out of the box. We don't, on the whole, reward that stuff. Our structures, our departmental structures, organisational processes don't reward thinking out of the box. We're pretty good at in-the-box thinking. If you're sitting in a transport team somewhere, you tend to think of your job as transport, but actually, can your transport role help bring about improved health? It's kind of, in some ways, counterintuitive, but that's exactly the kind of thinking we need to be doing. How can planners think about encouraging systems and structures that incentivise exercise? that get people out of cars and onto bikes or public transport and actually consider that as planners one of their objectives is quality of life and long-term environmental sustainability. Greening government is a completely laudable necessary ambition. Uh, even if, you, if we interpret it in the narrow sense we have to do it and we have to do it well and thoroughly and fast. The scale, the urgency and the connectedness of the big issues around the world of which we are a part demand that of us. And we're in many ways in a privileged position to be able to do that. In many cases, we, you, do it despite rather than because of the system. And we've got to try to work out how that system can adapt and change to enable correct sorts of behaviours. We need to be delivering the kinds of services that our economy and our people, I put that the other way around, our people and our economy want, need, expect and pay for. It's going to be a vital part of the UK's broader participation in the global debate around a changing climate, around uh, a fair or less fair world, that we lead by example to the greatest degree possible. In a changing world, we are curiously well positioned. I mentioned champagne grapes potentially growing at the bottom of my garden. 
there is a period of decades when the UK's quality of life in many ways improves. But the price being paid by others is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not a moral, ethical, I would argue, political or economic situation that is useful. It's a huge challenge, and the public sector is a fundamental part of it. Thank you very much indeed.